I'm Mark O'Brien. I'm a researcher at the University of Liverpool. I've co-authored Just Managing with Paul Cipriano, uh, manager of the Praxis Research Consultancy in Liverpool. This book, Just Managing What It Means for the Families of Austerity Britain, is based on the Getting By study that was conducted in 2014. The research team worked with 30 Liverpool families surviving on low incomes who volunteered to keep spending diaries over one year and were willing to be interviewed about how they got by from week to week. It was inspired by a study of more than a century ago, the roundabout a pound a week study conducted by the Fabian Women's Committee in Lambeth in 1913. The first thing that jumps out at you about the two studies is that even though so much has changed, in fact the experience of poverty is recognisable over the stretch of time from then to now. Employment insecurity, arbitrary treatment by employers, poor quality housing, having to work at more than one job to make ends meet, unsociable working hours, never having enough time for the children, falling into debt, exhaustion and depression, the worry of eviction, and so on. There's no question that things have become much worse for low-income families in the UK. All of these families talked of their incomes having gone down in recent years, whilst their basic week-to-week -week costs had risen. Pay freezes, reductions in tax credits, caps on benefits, rising rents, etc. have all created a punishing downward cycle for these people. When the 2010 coalition government came to power, the electorate was told that whilst cuts were needed to get rid of the national debt, the sacrifices involved would at least be fair the poorest would lose the least as a proportion of their incomes, the richest the most. For the 2010 Comprehensive Spending Review, a distributional impact assessment was produced with bar charts, all showing losses that were proportionate to original income level. After the five years of Cameron's 2010 to 15 government, we were able to look at the data to test those promises of fairness. Was it the case that the bottom income groups had sacrificed proportionately the least and the richest the most? No, it was not. In fact, the exact opposite had happened. The charts showing losses from benefit caps, reduced tax credits and cuts to services were a reverse mirror image of what had been promised. Those on low incomes had lost out the most in percentage terms, whilst the rich had lost very little indeed. In fact, the very richest had seen their share of the national wealth increase very significantly indeed in real terms. This large-scale macroeconomic effect was felt in very real material, social and psychological terms in the lives of the families who participated in the 2014 study. All of the families talked about how their incomes had fallen in real terms about pay freezes, about increases in essential costs, including rent, and of new financial demands, particularly associated with school-related costs and childcare. And yet, since 1998, we do have a minimum wage in the UK. As of April 2017, the UK adult rate is set at £7.50 an hour. This was called the national living wage. However, this was set well below the living wage determined by wide public consultation as the level required to maintain a decent standard of living for a family. For 2017, the Living Wage Foundation gives a figure of £8.45 an hour for this to be the case, considerably higher than the legal minimum adult rate. Now, putting to one side the fact that the level at which the national minimum wage has been set each year has failed to keep up with real terms consumer costs, is it the case that the existence of a minimum is having a positive effect for workers on low pay? Well, for those workers on the very lowest incomes, assuming their employers are not avoiding their legal requirements, which many of the most casualised sectors are, of course the higher rate will be beneficial. However, to properly assess this question, we need to look at employer behaviour. A national minimum sets a level below which pay should not fall, but it also creates a level to which employers can legally reduce their salary budget by paying their employees at or marginally above 
the minimum required. The effect over time has been a bunching of increasing numbers of workers who are stuck very close to the legal minimum with little or no prospect of ever moving above it. So for all of the rhetoric we've heard from successive governments about the need to break benefits dependency in the UK, what we've actually seen has been the creation of a new type of dependency, which is the dependency of workers and their families on the lowest levels of pay with no way back as benefits are taken away or forward through pay increases that keep up with inflation. The main beneficiaries of that are the millions of employers who are getting away with paying their workers at far less than the level required to maintain a decent standard of living. That is the real legacy of minimum wage policy in the UK. And it isn't enough to look at pay alone. We need to look at the totality of income, benefits and costs to understand what's going on for those living on low pay. It's not just that pay freezes have held incomes down while general costs have risen. The types of cost which have risen the most have been those that affect the poor the most. Rent is a case in point. Whilst homeowners have benefited from historically low and stable interest rates, the rapidly increasing numbers of families living in the private rented sector have not been so lucky. They have suffered soaring rent increases. Welfare payments and forms of state-related benefits, where they haven't been removed entirely or made less accessible with raised eligibility thresholds, such as working tax credits, have not been indexed appropriately in order to hold their value against consumer costs. The Consumer Prices Index, the lowest and for many years the preferred indexing measurement used by government, does not accurately capture the fluctuations of the goods and services that are of most relevance to the poorest families. Whilst government impact assessments look at the effect of policies in isolation from one another, it is the cumulative effect of many types of change that we need to consider. Low pay, combined with rising costs, combined with caps on benefits, combined with the loss of various types of emergency support, combined with reductions in spending on communities, combined with the loss of local amenities, combined with cuts to local authority budgets, and so on, conspire in a toxic mix that drags the poorest down to new levels of neediness, resulting in unmanageable debt, family breakdown, anxiety and depression, the constant fear of eviction, excessive working hours, exhaustion, and a host of other pernicious factors that are corrosive of decency in life and happiness within the family. We were told that government support would be focused upon the most vulnerable. The truth is that the real result of government social and economic policy since 2010 has been to push millions of working families into that category of the most vulnerable, who in fact find that there is no support for them at all in any meaningful sense. The families who shared their experiences with us over one year provided a vivid picture of the real effects of government policy upon their lives. They talked about there being never any slack in their week-to-week finances, so that when the unexpected financial demand arose, a broken washing machine, a bout of illness meaning loss of income, a benefit overpayment that has to be repaid, and so on, Carefully managed budgets simply went out of control. They talked about the effects of constant worry about money and insecure employment on their health, physical and mental. They talked about their never being enough time for their children. About debt and the fear of bailiffs. About the worry of eviction. For some having to go to food banks, and so on. And when it came to the question of who is to blame, these families were clear. In their view, it wasn't immigrants or Muslims, as we're all encouraged to believe by tabloid journalists. No. For these families, the blame lay squarely with government ministers who were out of touch with their experience 
and with a privileged elite who didn't care. Just managing what it means for the families of austerity Britain provides a detailed picture of what life is like for millions of families in the UK today. It also shows how the struggles of these families are entirely the result of government policy and exposes the deceits and manipulations on which they were based.